Hi, everyone. I'm Dina Matar. I'm the head of the School of Interdisciplinary Studies, within which the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy is situated. Um, I'm really honored to have been asked to introduce this um, conversation or talk today. I don't know how it's going to be um, going. Um, because it really speaks to you know, the, the title and the book, which I managed to read the introduction to before I came down, um, is, is very, uh, very exciting, talking about different ways, non-Western-centric uh, approaches to under understanding international relations. So I'm like you, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it and learning, um, and it kind of speaks to what we do at SOAS. Without further ado, um, you know, so welcome everyone on behalf of SIS. Thank you for attending. Uh, we have a distinguished panel with us. Um, um, I'll come back to Mira right here on my right l later on. Uh, but we have uh, Professor uh, Barry Buzan, who is Emeritus Professor of International Relations at the LSE. Um, he's an honorary professor at Copenhagen, uh, Jilin, and China Foreign Affairs Universities. And he's a senior fellow at LSE Ideas and a fellow of the British Academy. And then next to him, so I'm going straight on uh, according to the seating plan, um, is uh, Dan Plesch, who is director of the Center for uh, International Studies um, and Diplomacy at SOAS. He researches uh, widely, and he, he is a prolific writer. Uh, he has researched strategic studies and currently focusing on applying lessons of war termination and peace building from World War II to the 21st century. And then at the end is Dr. Amitav Asharia, who is the UNESCO Chair in Transnational Challenges and Governance, and he is Distinguished Professor at the School of International Service, American University, Washington, D.C. He is the first non-Western scholar to be elected um, in, in 2014 and 15, as the president of the International Studies Association, the largest and most influential global network in international studies. Previously, he was professor at York University in Toronto and the chair in global governance at the University of Bristol. And I come back to Dr. Uh, Mira Sabaratnam, who is um, one of our uh, colleagues at, uh, in international relations in the Department of Politics. Her research interests are in the colonial and post-colonial dimensions of international re relations in both theory and practice. She has worked on questions of decolonization, Eurocentrism, race and methodology in IR. But she is the face and the champion of decolonizing knowledge in general at SOAS. So I welcome the panel. I don't want to speak that uh, that much more, um, and I ask Mira to come forward to give us, you know, kind of an idea about how this is going to go ahead. And thank you for asking me to um, introduce the event. Thanks. Thank you, Dina. Okay, so thank you very much. It's very exciting to have this uh, panel here, which is celebrating uh, the publication of this book, which is a collaboration between uh, Barry and Amitav, The Making of Global International Relations, uh, The Origins and Evolution of IR at its Centenary. Uh, and Barry and Amitav will talk us through the, um, the arguments of the book and some of the major uh, claims and revisions it's making to the discipline of IR. I suppose what I wanted to do with my introduction um, in a substantive sense was locate where this book is sitting in terms of recent developments within the uh, discipline of international relations. Um, how many of you are sort of training within international relations as a, as a field? Just to get a sense. Okay, so lots of you. Um, and one of the interesting things that's um, always characterized this debate around international relations is the extent to which it's an autonomous field, the extent to which it's maybe a sub-discipline of political science as it's so often treated in the United States. Uh, and one of the ways in which international relations has been trying to confront what its real mission is, what its method should be, what its focus uh, should be, is actually through a debate about its origins and the relationship between theory and history, which is one of the major themes and the sort of productive uh, tensions within this book. So um, one of the contextual factors of this book, I suppose, coming into being um, is that over the last 20 to 30 years, the uh, Western-centric or Eurocentric character of international relations has been 
investigated, critiqued, worked over uh, by many scholars, um, and uh, prominently so by, by Amitav and by Barry. And it's within a context that post-colonial uh, critiques have been prominent, and we've also seen a turn to global history, global historical sociologies, uh, voices from the global south, and so on. And so this is a very timely book which attempts to bring together a conversation about the origins of the discipline with that conversation about its sort of Western-centric uh, character. And so it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to debate this and to examine it. I had the fortune of debating this at a panel last week at the British uh, International Studies Association. So in terms of how this uh, event is going to be run, um, Barry will speak uh, first for about 15 minutes, uh, then Amitav will speak uh, second for about 15 minutes, and, and Dan will have sort of 10 to 15 minutes to respond and to discuss. Uh, we'll give the panel maybe a short opportunity to respond to the points that they've raised to each other, and then we'll very much go out open to the floor for discussion, and we've got plenty of time uh, to do that. So please do think about questions, issues that you would like to raise uh, during the talks. So without further ado, I would like to invite Barry to come and open the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do the bit of this uh, from <laughs> the beginning, as it were, way back in the 19th century um, up until 1945. Um, the basic overview of what I'm going to do is to uh, talk about uh, the relationship between IR and small letters, namely the practice of international relations, and IR and big letters, namely the discipline of international relations. Um, and I'm going to do that in two periods, looking uh, at the 19th century up to the First World War, um, and then uh, at uh, the interwar period, and then I'll pass it on to Amitav as, as at the end of the Second World War. Um, the theme here is that IR was global from uh, the beginning. Uh, another theme here is that although this book is timed this year uh, to come out with the, uh, the, the so-called centenary uh, of the discipline, uh, because the founding myth of international relations, as most of you will know, is that it sort of started out um, in 1919, or at least this is the Aberystwyth version of the story. Um, but it's a widely accepted uh, myth, uh, and there is some truth in it. But there's also uh, quite a lot of not untruth in it, but a lot of stuff is missing uh, from it, because, as I hope to show you, um, there was IR before IR in the 19th century, and we tend to forget about that. So one of the features of what I'm going to do uh, is to try and revive that. Okay, so uh, the idea of... Uh, the, the organizing idea for, uh, for the book is that the world has been in a core periphery structure that was largely set up in the 19th century um, with the onset of modernity, um, and that this structure has shaped much of both small IR and, uh, and big IR. Okay. Um, I want to locate the roots of both kinds of IR, the practice and the thinking about it, in the 19th century, which is a bit unconventional because there are others who will trace um, the intellectual history of international relations right back to uh, the ancient Greeks and before. But uh, the view I'm taking here is that the revolutions of modernity in the 19th century reshaped practically everything about international relations and set up uh, this very stark core periphery system in which a small number of modernizing countries had vast amounts of wealth and power uh, compared to the rest and were able to set up uh, an international system and an international political economy that reflected that disparity of power. And that this was an unusual kind of power gap because it was very difficult to close. In talking about international relations, um, some of you may associate me with international relations theory, but Amitav and I here are taking a fairly broad view of what, as it were, counts uh, as international relations. So we talk about people who are thinking about uh, international relations in a systematic way. They may or may not be academics, and the further back you go, uh, the fewer of them actually are academics in the, uh, in the contemporary sense. So we want to bring into this idea of thinking about IR um, public intellectuals and political leaders and others who have had interesting 
big systematic things to say uh, about, uh, about uh, international relations. Right? So it's a, broad, it's a broad understanding. Right? And the other thing uh, that's going to feature in my talk, but less so in, uh, in Amitab's part of it, uh, is that this, uh, the two sides of this conversation are both, in a sense, global, but they don't start to integrate with each other. In other words, the conversation about IR in what we now call the Global South and the conversation uh, about IR in the core were very different and not at all connected or not very much connected things uh, during, uh, during this period. All right. So one of the things I'm going to struggle against here is that most of you will probably have fixed in your minds the idea that the First World War is a big disjuncture. Um, in international relations, that the anniversaries of that were not so long ago, and a big song and dance was made about how much the First World War changed and shaped the world. Well, that's worth thinking about, um, because certainly from a Global South perspective, it hardly changed the world at all. Um, and in, in, in a sense, it's, the big impact was in this rather small group of core countries. Okay? So that's going to be another one of the, the myths that we're going to uh, uh, question. So across this period, 19th century right up to 1945, colonial international society that was set up in the 19th century continues pretty much unaltered. The First World War makes relatively little difference to this. Um, it's, uh, it's mainly a European um, and, uh, and American, and to some extent, uh, Japanese form of imperial or colonial international society. The distribution of power within it remains multipolar right throughout this, uh, this period, um, and except for Japan, uh, the, the centers of power are all white and Western. Right? Um, right through this period, the colonial political economy that was set up during the 19th century, very much in a core periphery form, uh, remains in operation largely unaltered. And the key to this structure is that modernity, which occurs in a relatively small number of countries, mainly Western ones, but not all Western countries, um, and Japan at the same time as the Western countries, which is not often uh, credited, that handful of countries where the revolutions of modernity were first successful, um, they rule the roost for this period. They have pretty much all of the wealth and power um, and can pretty much do what they want. Uh, and this is a period in which those revolutions of modernity are unfolding very rapidly, um, increasing uh, the powers of production uh, and destruction and communication and transportation. All of this uh, rapid technological change is, uh, is a constant during this period um, as in the ones that follow. So the First World War is a disjuncture, uh, but it's mainly a disjuncture for those countries in the core. Um, and more arguably, you could say it's something of a disjuncture in that it closed down uh, the ultra-liberal uh, global economy that was set up uh, in the decades before 1914. Uh, so in this sense, the, uh, the Great Depression and protectionism and all of that familiar stuff from the 1930s killed off um, the, uh, the, the highly liberal global economy. Um, and another change consequent on this was that rival ideologies uh, took political power and began to compete for who was going to control the future of modernity. So it wasn't just um, liberal democracy and social democracy, but communism and fascism were also out there as alternative versions, uh, alternative political representations, if you will, um, of uh, modernity. Okay, so if we look in the, in the first period, um, the 19th century um, up until the end of the First World War, okay, um, we can see that the, uh, the the thinking about international relations, about modern international relations, um, has been much uh, shaped by uh, the actual practice of, of international relations. Um, before the First World War, there's an awful lot of thinking about international relations that goes on, as I say, a lot of it by public intellectuals uh, and politicians, uh, as well as by academics. But academically, the subject is not yet, uh, not yet particularly organized. 
Um, and much of uh, the discussion that's going on in the core uh, is not thinking about the relationship between the core and the periphery. It's just thinking about relationships amongst the core countries. That's the, the main root of IR and its, uh, and its Eurocentrism. Okay? Um, that thinking about relations between core and periphery is organized under a different heading called colonial administration. Um, and, and it doesn't that's not thought of as being part of international relations because international relations is something that in those days happens amongst civilized states, i.e. generally white ones with Japan included in an honorary way. But if you actually look at the details of who's doing what in the 19th century, there's a hell of a lot of familiar names and familiar topics up here. Right? Most of the main bodies that you would now think of as part of international relations theory they're already up and, up and running. Uh, lots of, of the main framing theories are there. War, strategic studies, geopolitics is all there. Um, international law, international organization, international society is all there. You can go back and look at this stuff. If you look at, say, Reinch, who was a well-known American writer before the First World War, I mean, he had quite a lot to say about intergovernmental organizations. But if you read his stuff, and nobody reads his stuff these days, partly because it's incredibly racist, like everything that was written in the West before uh, the First World War, it just took racism for granted. Five minutes? OK, thank you. So what I'm, I'm, what I'm saying there is IR before IR, and there's a lot of it. Right? The only thing that it doesn't have is the label. IR. So these things are all happening, uh, but they don't actually come together and get called IR until later. Okay. If we look at IR thinking in the, in the periphery at this, uh, at this time, um, this is mainly about anti-colonial, um, uh, anti-racist, and therefore anti-Western positions, mostly taken by public intellectuals and political leaders at the time. But there are a lot of interesting IR themes here, which are still going strong. Um, Pan-regionalism was a very major theme at this time. Um, sovereignty non-intervention, another theme. Uh, the development of international law as a way of, of, of getting yourself into the game on equal terms. Um, there was even beginning to be a literature about uh, development, uh, as you see here. But this stuff is all going on, as it were, with very little contact um, with the, uh, the kind of thinking uh, that I represented in the previous slide. Right? If we look at the second period, right, um, yeah, and we look in the core, we get the emergence of international relations then as a recognized field of study which has a name, or rather several names, and that debate about the name is still going on. Right? So that's, been, that's a debate that started a long time ago and uh, is still not settled. The, the founding myth is based around institutionalization, a few chairs in international relations, things like Chatham House um, uh, uh, and other kinds of think tanks got started uh, after the First World War. But this is really uh, pretty, pretty limited stuff. Um, it, there's some interesting features to it, which I could talk about for hours, but Mira has already given me the signal, so I, 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 I won't, but I can take that up in the Q&A if you'd like. That there were interesting international uh, organizations for the study of international relations, the International Studies Conference associated with the, the League of Nations and the Institute of Pacific Relations, which some of you in SOAS may be familiar with, which did big organizing work in putting together conferences and stimulated national committees uh, for thinking about international studies. Okay. There's the so-called myth of the great debate, which of course didn't happen during this period, but which was a post-1945 uh, construction. Uh, so you get a turn um, in the IR thinking in the core, which becomes very much obsessed with the League of Nations and the problem of war and peace uh, and all of that, uh, and which hardly is thinking about, uh, as it were, north-south or core periphery relations at all, because nothing has changed um, in, in that respect. There's a little bit of the origins of what uh, eventually becomes decolonization, but not enough to, uh, to disturb the general picture. Okay. In the periphery, 
you get quite a lot of continuity, the same motivation of anti-colonialism, anti-racism, and therefore to some extent anti-Westernism remains. And by and large, this is not being done by academics because there are relatively few universities that would have supported this in the, uh, in the periphery. So it's still, during this period, mainly separated from uh, the IR in the core. And, and the periphery thinking about IR doesn't really take up the uh, the League of Nations and uh, 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 and the well, the war peace issue in the same way it still retains its own uh, its own concerns about its subordinate uh, position there begins to be a little bit of institutionalization in the uh, in the periphery but uh, uh, but not much um, and uh, again you get certain extensions of the kinds of thinking that uh, I mentioned before about uh, about development about pan regionalism. Uh, and various other threads that come in here. Um, this man, Sarkar, and his Hindu theory of international relations, published in APSR in 1919, is a very interesting academic um, uh, uh, exception to, uh, to the rule, uh, something that didn't get much attention at the time, but might do, uh, might do now. So, to conclude, a lot of, uh, of, of modern IR thinking from both the core and periphery um, stretches right back into the 19th century. And we need to take this longer view because a lot of the kind of racist and colonial and geopolitical roots of IR thinking have just been forgotten. Right? They, they stop um, uh, after, after 1945. Right? Um, we need to take into account that thinkers other than academics contributed uh, a lot to this and that we still read um, a lot of those people. Up until 1945, there was little connection between these two discourses, although there should have been, um, in the sense that they, uh, they, they become integrated later on, as, Am as Amitav will, uh, will pick up. There is this dark side to IR, which I think we need to excavate and think about as part of the, uh, the roots from which our discipline uh, comes. And then when the Second World War comes, the Second World War has a much bigger impact um, on the relationship between small IR and big IR because a lot of things do change then. Racism um, as an institution of international society, colonialism as an institution of international society, all become uh, delegitimized. Um, and this changes then the relationship between North and South and you get the dynamic of decolonization, which begins to change the practice of IR, which then more slowly uh, changes thinking uh, about IR. Uh, our argument is that in, uh, from 1945, you get a virtual second founding of IR, huge institutionalization and, uh, and other things. Uh, but I will let Amitabh pick up the story at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Barry, and uh, thank you, uh, SOAS University, for... Uh, inviting us and uh, Dan Place for uh, organizing it kind of in an opportunistic way since uh, the funding for my trip to London was paid by University College, your friendly institution next door. Um, but uh, Dan is a uh, old friend and colleague and uh, I was delighted that uh, I could um, get uh, Barry and I could come and do this here. And also thanks to Mira, formidable scholar, and we are not only uh, hoping she would chair, but also contribute her uh, own thoughts into this field since she has done so much work on uh, <clears throat> things that are very dear and central to our project. So I will take up the story from where Barry left, but uh, slightly in a different way. I probably will uh, put a bit more emphasis on uh, IR theory, Western American IR theory that Barry hates, but I have to live with since I work in Washington, D.C. Um, but um, uh, I, I would uh, still continue the story uh, in the same way with the same assumptions and arguments. So uh, again, we're talking about uh, the small IR and the big IR. Uh, so what happens after 1945 is the big uh, shift when IR, which was uh, uh, kind of born in the UK, uh, no matter how you uh, how much of it that you accept, 
Um, but uh, it's sort of uh, the, the center of gravity of IR moves to the United States. In fact, so much so that Americans like uh, Stanley Hoffman said IR was born and raised in the US, which is very deeply offensive to the British. Um, and uh, in fact, even though we don't agree uh, that uh, IR was actually founded in one place at one time in the UK, but I, I also feel it strange that uh, there's no acknowledgement even of the U United Kingdom, um, so all or the Europe's role in this. But anyway, the central themes are uh, Cold War, nuclear weapons, uh, European integration, which is uh, from the liberal side, energy crisis, trade expansion. I'm kind of, uh, the, the book has two chapters, uh, two sets of chapters on these themes. So one on the empirics from uh, 45 to 1989 and, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, there is one chapter, then uh, 89 to 2008 becomes something else. But there is a little bit of overlap uh, between the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the post-Cold War period. But still, those are the major theoretical developments uh, in the field. Now, this is something I don't need to belabor with you because most of you would know this story. Uh, you know how re classical re realism became neorealism or structural realism, uh, Morgenthau to Walsh, and uh, how liberalism uh, from regional integration theory, Haas and Deutsch, uh, to a Cohen and Nye integration theories, neoliberal institutionalism, these are pretty, pretty central to the traditional IR uh, that uh, we are taught in uh, colleges and universities. The so-called second debate uh, between classical bull and singer debate between classical and scientific approach, uh, the neo-neosynthesis, neoliberalism and neorealism, very significant narrowing of IR uh, because of that. Uh, and also, we also know a fair bit, uh, uh, at least uh, even the mainstream Western textbooks do make a concession uh, to the non-Western world when it comes to dependency theory. Post-colonialism doesn't get as much recognition uh, because it started in the uh, other fields than IR, literature, and, uh, and history and like. But still, there is some recognition of this, uh, but generally, this story is pretty well known. What is less well known is, uh, that uh, many of these theories that assumed certain universalism uh, that uh, they claimed to speak for the entire world were actually not. They were very parochial. So in our book, we pay specific attention to uh, how these uh, theories, uh, religion, liberalism, and its variations, constructivism was not quite there yet, uh, how uh, they uh, passed the test when you the test being that how, to what extent they capture the reality, uh, realities of uh, the world at large, and uh, also what are the sort of uh, exclusions, marginalizations, and, uh, and also uh, analytical gaps in these theories when it comes to explaining and understanding what's happening in the, in the global south or the, or the larger world. So uh, we do have... Uh, these developments uh, also, I want to put them together in 19, um, after, well, again, the periodization is a little blurry. So 1980s and 2000s, uh, end of the Cold War, uh, towards the end of the Cold War to uh, maybe the global financial crisis of 2008. We also have a lot of developments in theory uh, reflecting the practice, uh, the, um, the actual developments in all politics. So after the end of the Cold War, liberalism takes on a new, uh, few new dimensions. Democratic peace theory becomes important. Liberal hegemony, which is very much uh, in uh, news because of the debate about uh, the end of the liberal order, uh, comes into being. There was no such term called liberal order before uh, uh, this period, by the way. Uh, it is a post-facto reconstruction of uh, the world by people like John Eikenberry. Uh, and realism takes on variations like offensive and defensive realism, neoclassical realism. Uh, and then uh, there are also, for the, at this time, some interesting challenges are emerging, per, but from within the West, within the core. So that will be post-modern, post-structural, Marxist, and this uh, third debate on inter-paradigm debates. Uh, feminism comes up, English school comes up, and of course, most centrally, uh, constructivism. Uh, constructivism basically has a re revolutionary impact. Uh, it becomes the most uh, kind of popular IR theory uh, after this period, according to uh, some surveys, that uh, Alexander Wend replaces Robert Cohen as the most influential IR thinker, according to this uh, trip survey from College of William and Mary. So all these things happen, and again, you know the story. 
Uh, the only major challenge from the periphery is the post-colonialism, which de replaces dependency theory, which has lost its luster by this time uh, because of the rise of the East Asian econo um, economic miracle. And also, post-colonialism adds uh, coming from within the periphery, unlike dependency, which is very economic oriented, post-colonialism uh, gives a central place to cultural identity and, uh, and other issues. But uh, again, looking at uh, the whole package of uh, these two periods, so 1945 to 89, and the post-Cold War period up to the <clears throat> financial crisis in 2008, we find there are significant gaps in both. And this is the key theme of the book, which you do not find in a lot of the writings. Uh, in some writings you do, but not in all writings. So the mainstream theories pretty much either ignore the non-West, or whatever you call it, global South or a third world, uh, either due to lack of interest, a lack of knowledge, or due to a belief that Western theories can explain everything. So people like Robert Cohen, when he uh, wrote a preface to his book, uh, International Institutions and State Power, uh, whose subtitle is called A Theory of All Politics, he says that I know nothing about uh, uh, the international relations or IPE of uh, uh, countries outside of Western Europe, United States, Canada, and Australia. And he says that this reflects the Americanocentrism of the field, but there's not a damn thing I can do about it. He actually says that, and we quote that. Uh, so there's uh, ignorance or lack of interest in finding out. I mean, uh, 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 kind of a lack of intellectual curiosity that, uh, about these countries or the belief that these countries don't matter. But uh, there are also a belief uh, that, uh, like uh, in, a, in a book uh, Michael Mastandino and uh, John Eikenberry edited, they say that Western theories should apply to the Asia Pacific and everywhere else, because these countries, after all, have taken on the Western norms and institutions. So after being decolonized, they have taken on Westphalian sovereignty, and the, the expand, international society uh, from Europe has expanded. So the, our theories that uh, are derived initially from Europe does have global applicability. So that's basically what sums up uh, those mainstream theories. Uh, constructivism is slightly different uh, because it focuses on uh, col uh, ideas, culture, and identity. You might think that they would be more sensitive to uh, cultural differences and identity uh, claims, but it doesn't in the beginning, at least in the beginning. It sort of say, has this own moral cosmopolitanism narrative. The good global norms come out of the West, propagated by Western um, entrepreneurs, and the rest of the world basically are passive recipients, are students, as opposed to uh, they're taught these norms by uh, Western uh, norm entrepreneurs. Now, what about critical and alternative approaches? Now, many of them came out of the core itself, postmodern, post-structural. In fact, uh, some people argue that they basically replaced the Anglo with the Franco, uh, so, so Anglo-American rationalism uh, challenged by uh, continental sort of post-structuralism, uh, and uh, many of them still legitimize Western dominance, especially liberal hegemony, uh, but uh, ideationally also constructivism, which can be partly mainstream, partly challenging a critical theory, uh, talks about uh, Western norm-giving, as I mentioned, and epistemological, as I said, Anglo-US rationalism, uh, goes with continental post-structuralism, it doesn't do very much to bring in uh, the non-Western or global South uh, uh, concerns and voices. It's a very interesting debate uh, between the Durian and uh, Sankaran Krishna, one of my classmates from JNU, uh, where he takes on uh, post-structural th scholars uh, for ignoring uh, the, 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 the global South. So the post-colonialism, which is the most interesting development from the global South, uh, I guess my understanding, which I will be very curious to hear from Mira, uh, that uh, there is a lot of emphasis on resistance, dissent, uh, and, uh, but there is also some sort of a lack of a corresponding attention to agency. Uh, so can subaltern speak? Okay, but can subaltern act? And uh, that is changing more recently, and there is a lot more work on agency. Uh, but initially, at least, it was basically a critical theory in, in, in the true sense of the term, uh, and uh, in a sense challenging the exclusion and marginalization of the uh, post-colonial world, uh, and uh, rather than investigating agency, unless we take agency as a form of resistance as a form of agency, which I do in some of my own writings. 
So ideas from the periphery, this is a period, especially from the 80s, there's a lot of developments in IR around the world. So IR was global in the beginning, as Barry pointed out, and now IR takes up in an uneven way, in a, in a different, in a, not uh, all parts of the world are sort of are taking interest in IR theory in the same way or IR as a subject. But generally you find that developments in India, in China, China in particular, uh, Marxism took cultural uh, narratives, which is underpinning the Chinese school of IR. Latin America moves away from dependency to autonomy and peripheral realism, uh, and the Middle East, uh, uh, where uh, places like Turkey and Iran, where IR started, uh, similar to many parts of the world, as a way of uh, uh, training diplomats, uh, takes on more theoretical interests, so it's kind of reverse of the practice turn. So it's pra from practice to theory, as opposed to theory to practice. And, uh, and Russia and Eastern Europe, after the end of the Cold War, uh, starts, well, part Eastern and Central Europe turns to the West. Russia uh, initially was interested in turning to the West, but then uh, were re felt rejected, and now is into civilizational discourse and much more inward looking. But anyway, uh, theory is never consistently uh, embraced around the world, and uh, there are there is enormous diversity between and within countries and regions when it comes to IR. And even within China, the Chinese school is challenged by uh, other types of approaches in China. Uh, and also we find that there is neither wholesale adoption of Western theories nor wholesale rejection. There is a kind of localization and adaptation uh, of uh, theories from the West uh, and, uh, and doing that to build uh, concepts and theories that brings in the local and indigenous experience. So what about the future? Sorry, what about the global IR? The global IR is a construct, it's not a theory. Uh, it doesn't reject, but tries to broaden uh, existing IR theories. It traces the multiple foundations of uh, IR, as uh, we have uh, described, including non-Western origins of IR in discipline and theory. It is rooted in global history rather than European or American history. It embraces pluralistic universalism, which is a way of saying that it acknowledges and respects diversity and identity, but doesn't necessarily uh, um, welcome or uh, express enthusiastic support for cultural exceptionalism, that every culture is different, therefore theory has to be all culturally grounded uh, in, in, in a very uh, rigid and narrow sense. It embraces regions and area studies, which will be good news to uh, here, for example, which has a substantially rich uh, legacy in area studies, and then also very vitally the agency claims of others, including post-colonial and non-Western societies and actors. So we can talk a little bit more about that during discussion, but I would like to leave you with the about future. Now, we see IR uh, has made tremendous progress since uh, the 100 years ago uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, there is more conversation between the core and the periphery, but still there is a persistence of Western dominance, American dominance in particular, and this is done through teaching, publishing, gatekeeping, hiring, citations, and all, all kinds of intellectual practices, which uh, many of you should know, but uh, we can talk about. It. In the global south also, there are certain uh, reasons for, uh, you know, uh, where IR remains underdeveloped, and uh, that would be resource constraints that may be changing in some countries like China, but it's very acute in other parts. Language barrier, the dominance of the English language is a huge factor when you try to bring in uh, scholars from Latin America or uh, China. Um, policy preoccupation, a lot of IR scholars are uh, very engaged in policy. They don't see theoretical or disciplinary development as critical, and the self-censorship or censorship. The uh, scholars are rather afraid to check on the government and therefore have a kind of open discourse which would uh, advance theoretical debate and, uh, and reflection. At the same time, as I said, IR has come a long way. There is growing global interest in IR. There is growing, growing interest in national and regional perspectives, which uh, some people are worried that might lead to fragmentation. But uh, some, uh, we generally believe that uh, this is something that is probably uh, is going to be around, uh, they have to stay, and it can actually also be helpful in globalizing the discipline, as long as the conversation is not too parochial and uh, the theories that develop from national or regional context can travel rather than be applied only to that country or the region. And finally, given the ongoing shift in power and ideas, um, might there be a, this rise of the rest 
uh, lead to a growing voice of emerging powers and global south in reshaping IR. We don't know the answer to that, how soon this will happen, but this is a factor that needs to be closely observed and watched for. So let me stop there. Sorry, Thank I took you. a Perfect. few more minutes. Thanks very much to uh, Barry Nawata for coming and uh, Mira for, for chairing and you all for uh, turning out uh, on a day which is threatening to look like summer, uh, slightly outside, <laughs> if we're very lucky. Um, so uh, I'm also delighted to be working uh, from time to time uh, with Amitav uh, at American University. And what I'm going to talk about uh, reflects some of the ideas that we've been discussing and some of... Uh, the research that I've been doing with Tom Weiss at, uh, in New York, uh, which was kindly supported by the Carnegie Corporation. Uh, and in that context, uh, we're, I'm really talking about developing what's already been said, supplemental and in no sense contradictory. Uh, and I found the, the work of the book uh, very, very helpful. And I want to offer a phrase which I find quite helpful in framing my own thought, um, the restorative archaeology of knowledge which I'll come back to. But I think in the contemporary world, the, perhaps one of the defining issues which we need to have in mind or defining questions uh, as we look at uh, this work with uh, presumably a normative um, intent is uh, what in both IR and IR, uh, whether upper or lower case, uh, is most useful uh, in a global emanc emancipation project and in uh, facing the uh, environmental and weapons-driven uh, extinct extinction crisis. Uh, what is most useful in this? Um, and uh, this is a, a working definition, and I'll talk to it, uh, but as a child of the counterculture, um, Foucault and so forth were all out and all the rage when I was first in, in college, uh, but it seemed to me that this is a concept which helps bridge um, uh, IR and social science theory and uh, historical uh, study as well, that it's a, a term um, which perhaps can help us deal with the, uh, what uh, Professor Hurrell talks of as the relentless presentism in IR and sometimes the uh, unreflective um, uh, positivism of, of history and to help bridge that, that gap. Um, civilizational self-destruction is important in international relations but is as we've heard not particularly present in IR. Um, for example a disarmament as a theme comes into just four percent of all the publications and book reviews of millennium uh, in its entire history, four percent. Uh, where it is a uh, major concern of the global south, uh, Bandung and after, um, the secondly, this, the term Western, which is used in, in the book a lot and in discussion, does need a lot of deconstruction. I certainly find myself a, an intellectually displaced person uh, in that construction, because coming from my own background, uh, it's a very different uh, experience, uh, both in, in writing and, and in practice. Um, I'm really looking at the post-World War II period, um, but want to put it to you that the, uh, the account of, uh, presented in IR of the development of international relations since World War II is based on a very conservative US framing of the practice and experience of international relations during that conflict. And that leads to, I think, some uh, severe misunderstandings about the construction of the post-war order and both our critiques of it and the use we can make of it today. And I'll explore some of those issues. And that presentism, even in critical studies, leads, leads uh, researchers to uh, critique um, what I suppose in the, in the colloquial term would be an Aunt Sally, a straw, a straw person of um, a conservative paradigm uh, being critiqued in the 70s and later, which actually didn't really exist, that the paradigm of the uh, 1940s is much more radical uh, than uh, is presented in an IR and in, in, in a conservative history uh, of the period. Uh, some examples, um, uh, and, and Barry mentioned this to a, to a degree, that there is a clear ideological competition going on 
um, with a, a liberal capitalist um, view, a liberal democracy, competing um, uh, with fascism and communism as ideologies, but also in intra-American politics, which is almost entirely overlooked in uh, our view of how America came out of World War II as the good guys. That was by no means certain, and I've written about this to some degree. Um, and what we find uh, is that, as I discuss it in a term with, uh, with Tom Weiss, that um, the exigencies of the global crisis and domestic crisis and competition means that political leaders and publics uh, who perhaps are driven by Hobbesian realism end up uh, regarding Kantian international cooperation as essential to social and international survival. And that is a lesson, I think, which you can trace back from elites back to 1815, but becomes a more and more popular and public concern as a result of the ensuing conflicts. And I think you can trace a line uh, from um, the Congress of Vienna through to the threats of climate change today, where more and more the self-destructive potential of industrial society becomes a defining issue in international politics, but not so often in international relations or international history. But it is what drives large parts of domestic and international society. The UN, um, which exists during the Second World War and not just after, is an ideology of universalism, of left social democracy, if you read the, the defining documents of the period, born out of um, strong public and elite interest, not simply an elite project. Um, and it's critical, and I've written about this a great deal, and I won't dwell on it here, but we assume the outcomes of World War II as a given. And in fact, how far the United States uh, ended up as it did, is highly contested within the United States at the time. So the fact that the Americans were providing cash-free weapons to its allies, that relied upon a globalist ideology to convince the American public to get that through the Congress. And it wasn't a done deal. The ideological ancestors of Donald Trump were looking to cut off all military assistance to the Soviet Union as soon as the Nazis surrendered at Stalingrad at the beginning of 1943. I don't want to take us into too much history here, um, but these are critical moments uh, which define the outcome of the war in international politics today. And the, inter the uh, intra-United States debates we see today uh, echo those with the United States even within this period. And it's this internationalist globalist ideology which is used to mobilize American public and its allies towards the outcome that we find. And this is part of an international effort. So Chinese, Indians, Ethiopians, are, we find in our research to be founders of international criminal justice before the United States and United Kingdom in the international politics of the era. But the Kuomintang not being in fashion, uh, the international efforts of its lawyers and politicians in the 1940s don't get to have much hearing from anybody. Uh, similarly, gender equality in the UN and therefore globally comes out almost entirely through the uh, action, through the agency of Latin American women. Actually, with the Anglo-American women telling their, their uh, Latin American colleagues not to ask for anything as vulgar as explicit genuine equality in the UN Charter. Uh, and this is debate takes place on the floor and the outcome of that southern agency into the core of the glo of global international system is decisive and we all benefit from it. But this is southern agency, not northern agency. Uh, similarly, as a footnote, it's worth mentioning that the Arab League is formed before the United Nations out of the experience of how they were treated at Versailles, the Arab countries decide they need to get their act together before the post-war order is established in order to get themselves a voice. 
So the Arab League, I think, is February of 45, UN Charter, October. Uh, and again, this doesn't fit into the received wisdom of which we uh, have inherited. Um, the implications of the points that I... Uh, so uh, just with bullet points, are, I think, quite profound. That they provide a more useful resource for uh, the globalised problems we face today. Uh, climate emergency, renewed war, the reactionary resurgence, if not triumph. Um, and that we take for granted uh, the fact that the post-war order, uh, yes, Nazis defeated, but... Um, there were many in Washington who were very, would have been very happy to have had a negotiated peace with the Nazis and gone after the Soviet Union at that period. The fact that didn't happen, that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not followed by the bombing of Moscow, is something which, frankly, hardcore realists have difficulty explaining. <laughs> uh, because that uh, uh, white, supre white global supremacy from Washington, supported by the atomic bomb, is, one might say, a, a natural realist outcome of 1945. And the political dynamics that didn't create that and gave us the order we have didn't come out of a few intellectuals. It came out of political leaders and popular movements who were contesting the conflict ideologically as well as militarily in the period. Uh, and that the post-war order, as I've been discussing with work with, uh, with Amitav, is far more which, one which is radical, social democratic, and in the old sense, liberal, um, rather than... Uh, the sort of conservative liberal ideology, and certainly at that period would have regarded the neoliberal agenda as simply being the political agenda which created the Second World War. Unrestrained armaments, unrestrained global economics, and no attention to mass unemployment were all regarded as principal drivers towards World War II, something perhaps they could remember today or we could remind them of. The UN itself provides legitimacy for emancipation that comes later in decolonization. Today, in speech acts at the UN, uh, you see climate and the bomb defining issues of international relations, but IR is generally stubbornly deaf to these priorities. So I think there are some themes we can use to take forward. Um, that the self-destructive potential of industrial society is, I think, the defining issue uh, emerging out of the period we've been analysing, uh, not at the periphery, even if it is peripheral in much international relations scholarship, for the reasons that Amitav uh, pointed to. Um, just one or two best points. On, on the presentation, and particularly about the development of IR. I, I'm a great um, fan of the utterly neglected late work of um, Hans Morgenthau, um, where in his uh, work on New American Foreign Policy in the late 1960s, he became, basically becomes an Einstein peacenik. Uh, everything has changed. The bomb has changed everything. Uh, we are taking the wrong course in trying to adapt and integrate nuclear weapons into traditional politics, we have to change politics, culture, and society. And so from the point of view of late Morgenthau, feminist foreign policy is a natural product of classical realism, understanding the implications of the bomb. But uh, rather, I think, like the Catholic Church in uh, trying to use uh, Galileo to justify the flat earth, on the basis of what Galileo may have thought before he picks up a telescope. Uh, IR still cites Morgenthau on the basis of what he wrote in the 50s, not on the basis of what he wrote in the late 1960s. And that, I think, is an, epitomizes the problem we have in the way in which IR treats itself and its own discourses, but also the way in which um, IR um, does act as a political policeman for a particularly conservative ideology which, frankly, has become extremely dangerous. Thank you. OK, so thank you very much, um, and thanks for those talks. Um, I'm tempted to take the kind invitation from Barry and Amitav and Dan to also share a few of my own thoughts, maybe before going into Please. the Q&A um, 
if that's all right. And I suppose um, I think it might be helpful, at least from a, a didactical, pedagogical uh, perspective. Um, and the, so the positionality that I'm commenting from is from somebody who's been working within the post-colonial tradition of international relations um, and thinking about this from the traditions of that sort of radical, critical um, uh, standpoint. And so I wanted to raise a, a few questions. One of the elements, I think, of the narrative that Barry set out with and that Amitav um, uh, followed up with uh, that I find provocative is the idea that the core and the periphery were not intellectually integrated during the 20th century. Um, and I note that in the presentation and in the book as well that, uh, say, W.E. Du Bois is linked with Africa um, and and that's put together with the claim that the core and periphery are not connected. Now, Du Bois, of course, was a famous advocate of Pan-Africanism uh, in his life, but he was an American. He was born in the, north, uh, the northern states in America. Uh, he taught at Atlanta for 20 years, got his PhD from Harvard, um, worked in the NAACP, et cetera, et cetera. His long career was in America. He finally lost his American passport, um, or they withdrew it in, when he was in his 80s, uh, when he decided to go communist and go off to uh, Ghana and hang out with Kwame Nkrumah. So... What is interesting about the story of W.E.B. Du Bois, not just biographically, but intellectually, is about that place that he occupies between the West and the non-West. And one of the points that I would like to offer by way of uh, um, a rejoinder to Barry and Amitav's book is that the, the West and the non-West are much more intellectually and politically entangled than in the way that is set out in the book. Now, one of the things that Du Bois does is directly engage with the arguments that are going on in the West about the nature of Western international relations. He has public debates with figures such as Lothrop Stoddard, who are talking about the uh, dangers of a race war, uh, arguments which in some respects were echoed by Samuel Huntington's work in the 1990s about the clash of civilizations. And what Du Bois is arguing is that the nature of race is not... Um, the sort of essential quality that the white supremacist thinkers are interpreting it as. He's saying it's something which is essentially invented, it's constructed globally and historically in order to facilitate imperial extraction, right? Race is invented so that blacks and browns and, and as you know, um, the other races of the world can be incorporated into the global system of production. And he puts that into dialogue with an analysis of Western society itself. He's saying, okay, Western society is industrializing. You've suddenly got this massive working class and they need uh, something to feel superior about, something to hang on to. Uh, and so he sees imperialism and colonialism as in a way a kind of um, political compensation for the white working classes of the world, right? It gives them uh, consumer products. It gives them a sense of uh, well-being and superiority and so on. Is Du Bois a non-Western thinker? Is he thinking in the periphery? I don't think so. I actually would consider him a core thinker, talking in the core and in the periphery, because these are geographically and politically and sociologically entangled spaces. Um, and I think this is important because it also thinks it also travels forward to how we think about post-colonialism within IR in the sort of post-45 period. And again, much of the thinking is uh, done within the West, right? It's put, it's progressed at Columbia University and in, you know, um, in Cambridge and Oxford and places like this. These are core institutions in the sort of traditional Western sense. But it is mobile people, transnational people, diaspora people, displaced people, exiles, who become the intellectual core of this project. And their arguments are very much directly in dialogue with the Western arguments or the core arguments or the more politically hegemonic arguments. So I think this gives us a much more complicated understanding of the relationship between core and periphery, Western, non-West, colonial and anti-colonial than is necessarily presented um, in the book. And so in terms of the tradition that I write in, I would, I would encourage us to understand the periphery and the non-Western as not parochially contained, right? They are actually making global arguments. They're making fundamental arguments. They're talking about the big picture things. They're not having an internal conversation amongst themselves about 
how to organize Latin America. They're saying enormous structural things about how the world works. And I think as Dan's presentation nicely brought out, they're then discussing these in transnational spaces and including this in transnational activism. So dependency theory, for example, uh, propagated in the UN in the 1960s by Latin American social scientists becomes a central intellectual issue uh, in scholarship, but also becomes an important uh, political consideration in how uh, UNCTAD and UNESCO understand you know, the organization of the world and how to deal with it. So I would, I mean, maybe like Barry and Amitav to come back a little bit on the entangled character of the global during this, this period. Uh, the other thing I would like to pick up is the question about whether racism disappears after 1945. Because again, in the story that we've been told about international relations and international relations theory, um, is that racism disappears. I would suggest that it doesn't, and to some extent the IR theories are still racialized in a great number of res respects. Samuel P. Huntington's Clash of Civilizations thesis is one of the more obvious, well-known examples of an account of world order that is heavily racialized, that depends on a number of uh, racialized assumptions about how society is organized, what values they have, how they behave, and so on. Um, and I don't think it's so easy to say that it stops. Um, so one thing, again, that I'd invite the authors to reflect on is the continuities of racism when it's not an explicit ideology, right? When you haven't got the scientific, in inverted commas, scientific uh, part behind it, but we still see racism as kind of pervasive within domestic societies and global societies around the world. Um, and I suppose the final question I would ask, um, and this is something that came up a little bit in the uh, discussion we had last week uh, at BISA, is about thinking about how the non-Western itself becomes a kind of political category and how, um, how it can facilitate quite nationalist and imperialist projects within spaces such as China and India. Um, in articulating alternative schools of IR, because international relations in its formal organized sense has always been closely aligned to foreign policy establishments. And one of the consequences of the emergence of stronger foreign policy establishments within China and India and Indonesia and so on is a desire for scholarship that speaks directly to and with the interests and ideologies of those establishments. Um, and so when we're thinking about where alternative thinking about world order can come from that is rooted in, let's say, the uh, social structures and experiences of uh, the world outside Europe, we need to be careful about who exactly is speaking and with what voice and with what interest. So um, I suppose that's another consideration. Anyway, I will I've abused that chairing position enough and no one to tell me to be quiet. So I'll um, maybe stop there with the... Uh, Questions. I think what I would like to do now is maybe ask um, Barry and Amitav to take a couple of minutes seats uh, from their seats to maybe reflect on some of the things that Dan raised or anything else that they want to throw in before we go out to questions. Does that sound all right with everyone? Okay, great. So Barry, I'll just make sure your mic is switched on. Uh, yeah, I'll we'll do that all by myself. Yeah, there's some kinds of technology I can still handle. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I'm losing ground, I have to say. Um, Okay, I'll just pick up a couple of points then. Um, uh, I like Dan's phrase very much about restorative archaeological knowledge. That, uh, that resonates with me. Um, I think all I would do is, is elaborate a bit on uh, some things that you said, because I think um, those uh, coming into uh, international relations are, broadly speaking, unaware of what a habit the discipline makes of forgetting things. Right? Um, so there's a continuous state of reinvention going on, which you don't really begin to see or get until you've been looking at it for several decades. Um, and, and this is a kind of, therefore, structural feature of the, uh, of the discipline, and it applies to lots of stuff. Sometimes things are systematically forgotten. So geopolitics was systematically uh, suppressed after 1945. Um, likewise, race theory as a legitimate theory, right? Uh, because race theory was one of the most important ways of thinking about IR. And it was a matter of everyday conversation and zero embarrassment to those who were engaged in the discourse about it. And if you look back at that stuff, it reads very oddly now, uh, 
um, but it was the normal practice of the day. And that was simply forgotten after 1945, probably because it would have been cosmically embarrassing to the Americans to carry on with it. Um, feminism was forgotten. Um, there was a whole interesting development of feminist IR thinking uh, based in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in the 20s and 30s. Zip disappeared after 1945 and then gets reinvented in the 70s and 80s as if it's for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, I was around for that. I was also around for the, the discovery of international political economy in the 1970s as if it had never been thought about before. Um, but it was a normal part of thinking about IR in the interwar years and just got forgotten about, uh, or suppressed in, uh, in relation to other things. So I think there's a... Uh, there's some big acts of forgetting. Um, there's a very interesting study to be done as to why particular things were forgotten. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with what Amitab was describing with the, uh, you know, that after 1945, the United States becomes very influential in IR, becomes the kind of center of gravity, um, not so much on the basis of quality, but quantity. Um, and American IR, it has to be remembered, is, is a very peculiar species. It's not representative of how the rest of the world does it. The American association of, of IR with political science is something that goes back well into the, uh, into the 19th century, and it's not true anywhere else. I mean, IR doesn't come out of political science in this country or on the continent uh, or in China or India. Uh, or anywhere else. So it's a very distinctive and peculiar uh, American way of thinking about IR, that it should be thought of as international politics. Okay. Um, and then just one response to, uh, uh, to Mira. I mean, I, um, I don't, I'll try and speak for Amitav here, and I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm wrong. I, um, I think um, we agree uh, that there wasn't zero interaction between what was going on uh, between core and periphery. Uh, because, I mean, from, from my money, the, uh, you know, Benoit Kumar Sakhar's work, which is remarkable. I mean, there's several articles, and he publishes them all in American journals and quite big American journals at, uh, uh, at the time. Whether they got any resonance or not, I don't know. But the mere fact that he's publishing them is, is, uh, is of interest. So there's certainly stuff going on. Um, but that said, the mainstream taxonomy right up until 1945 keeps colonial administration and international relations amongst civilized powers as entirely separate subjects. And that does seem to me to be, uh, uh, to be uh, significant. Um, so uh, I, I also don't have any problem with your argument that the IR, the thinking about IR that's going on, the, on in the periphery is global thinking. It's, it's certainly global in the way it's thinking and what it's thinking about. It's not global in the sense that it's not knitted up with the thinking about IR going on in the West, and therefore there isn't a global IR, big IR, in that, uh, in that sense. Okay, great, thank you. Amitav. Yes, uh, picking up on Barry, and uh, especially the, the last point, um, I particularly, but both of us generally were very sensitive to not make, make everything from Global South uh, coming as anti this, anti that, anti Western, anti uh, colonial, anti racist. We are also very much into pro this and pro that. So in page 47, we make it very clear, although it should have been developed further, that uh, IR thinking in the periphery during the interwar years was not just about anti colonialism, but also contained ideas about internationalism, world order, international development, cooperation, and justice. It extended well beyond anti imperialism. In fact, uh, in the previous chapter also, we look at people like Tagore, who was uh, not only, uh, he was actually uh, not a nationalist, he was an internationalist. Uh, it's, it's very strange. He, uh, he rejected nationalism at a time when India was fighting the British. And he said, nationalism is terrible. It's bad. He went to Japan and China to tell them that don't be nationalistic. Look what's happening to Europe. That happened several decades before Europe fell into this uh, ultra-nationalism and fascism. And that's why people like Arnold Tanby said that Tagore was well ahead of his time in criticizing nationalism. So, so that's a very important point. We were very sensitive to that. Uh, but... Uh, but point well taken. I mean, I think it helps us to bring that uh, to the fore. From uh, your other point about, uh, Amira's other point about uh, core periphery uh, entanglement. Also, um, again, we would have no problems with that. I think it's a very important point. Um, 
you can also make the same argument about uh, uh, that you make about Du Bois, uh, uh, about Nehru, who was uh, educated right here, and uh, and I was talking about uh, you know I was many ways influenced by Lasky. So many people don't accept him as non-Western. They think he's uh, as Western as it gets. Uh, but uh, at the same time, he is. Uh, the intellectual perspective he was providing was uh, had, uh, for the lack of a better word, a non-Russian perspective, but he was straddling both the walls, and there's no question about it. Our main point was very simple, that the, the IR scholarship did not recognize this, and that's what was happening. So the conversation that uh, was actually happening in the real world, the entanglement, was never reflected in the IR discourse in the textbooks, and we look at a number of textbooks where pan-Asianism and pan-nationalism was cast as some kind of a, uh, ethnic uh, uh, imperialism. At one book, uh, the most popular textbook of uh, 1930s in IR uh, in, the, in the US, uh, rejected and believed that these are non-progressive reactionary uh, you know, uh, ideas. So, so the mainstream IR, uh, whether E.H. Carr, Hans Morgenthau, did not recognize this, that there was such progressive ideas uh, uh, in the world. So that's why the conversation was not uh, entangling in that sense, but not in real practice. And uh, in Caribbean, North um, uh, United States, and Africa, there was a genuine transnational conversation going on. And finally, racism. Again, point well taken. We kind of depart from that original foundational theme of racism. Uh, uh, like a journal of race development becoming foreign affairs and all. We did that in the beginning and then kind of a little bit move away. We kind of get into uh, a broader category of ethnocentrism. That's the term that I um, uh, have been more I mean, kind of, I've been using in my work, but some of that permeates this book as well, our joint book as well. And uh, we do look at how exclusion marginalization happens, and it's uh, part of it is race, part of it is intellectual arrogance. But in the end, we do talk about uh, intersectionality and race, but nothing as adequately as we, sh we could have done. So that's a point well taken. Finally, a quick point on Dan. I mean, um, all these things we are working together on a project to establish agency in the creation of the UN. Uh, but what he said gives me another kind of nail uh, to hit on the coffin of the liberal not order. My, not my coffin. <laughs> <laughs> coffin of the liberal order. Uh, that liberal order was not a really liberal order. It was a social uh, democratic order. And uh, maybe it would have been, what you say, is a more universal social democratic order. But it's misrepresented and misappropriated as liberal. And I think that's a very good point uh, that... Uh, in some of our future work we'll take up. Okay, thank you. Um, wonderful. I think that's probably enough from the panel for a short while, and I'll <laughs> ask for questions. Um, please feel free to ask questions about this project, but I'm sure Barry and Amitav will be very happy to uh, answer questions about uh, other projects or other issues. So, are there any questions? We have one down at the front. I see that there are two roving mics being held by Alex at the back. Um, Fadil, are you able to grab them? Okay, we've got quite a lot of questions. So what I suggest is I will uh, collect them in groups of three, is that all right? And then we will come to the panel and we'll come back and forth. So if you can make your questions relatively you know, direct, that will give uh, us lots of time for them. Um, so I'll start with the, sorry, can you put your hands up again? Yes, this lady here in the red, and then I'll come around and then back in the middle. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Dawkins, and I'm studying law at Oxford University of London. Um, my question is, um, what do you think of the very recent speech by um, the Prime Minister of Malaysia in the United Nations General Assembly and also in the recent news talking about a global, global rule of law um, in the United Nations? Do you think it's feasible um, today or do you think it's merely a utopian idea? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll go to the back, the gentleman in the blue T-shirt. So I'm just going to do this kind of going this way across the room. So yeah. Hi there, Asad Zaidi, um, LSE student in international relations. Um, thank you for your talk. I uh, just wanted to ask uh, briefly a couple of questions. One being, is the kind of relationship between core and periphery that um, you highlight in the book, is it relevant to a kind of contemporary understanding of, of how relations are need to be understood in a single analytical field for us to kind of move forward. I'm thinking about 
um, for example, Sudan, uh, the Janjaweed militia that have been supported by the EU and by the Gulf states, that requires a relational understanding of politics that straddles beyond area studies and beyond kind of the confines of an Indian or a Saudi Arabian IR. So that's my first question. And, and regarding that, how can we better kind of divulge different forms of Southern agency within that? So one form of Southern agency would be the, the militant. Another form of Southern agency would be the Indian garment workers that facilitate the rise of the Industrial Revolution. So in your book, do you go into detail about how we can spatialize um, analytical relations beyond core and periphery? And, um, and do you go into the different ways in which we can look into Southern agency? And my last question is about... Ooh, oh, controversial. Really, okay, really Very quickly, 10 seconds. My last question is about um, the non-West as an analytical category. Is it useful? Um, because I don't see how it can be very useful in a world in which we've moved beyond those categories and in which things are so relationally entangled, we see things that go beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more question. The gentleman here in the black jacket, and then I'll come back to the panel. Hi. Uh, Shonak, I'm a doctoral candidate in international relations at King's College London. I have two quick questions. First, uh, when we're talking about uh, the essentially the provincialization of IR, if we can call that, that whether it's an Anglo-Saxon discipline or an European discipline, how important is the methodological distinctions? A lot of American international relations is heavily quant driven. So uh, like today, it could be very difficult for a Binoy Kumar Shorkar to publish in the American Political Science Review. How, what would be the take of the panel on that, number one? And uh, my last question, I'll keep it short, it is that uh, we are looking at the difference, if I understood correctly, as a difference between theory and thought on international relations. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the point, the analytical point where we can uh, where we can uh, distinguish that uh, something which is an universal thought emanating versus a thought which is just reflective of the societal and the power political uh, milieu of uh, that uh, particular point in time. Yeah. All right, thank you. Great questions. Um, Amitav and Barry, in whichever combination uh, you desire. Maybe start with Amitav? Um, yes. Dan, would you like to come in? And some of this? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> to take all the questions and leave some Sorry. for Barry, the more difficult ones. But uh, <laughs> um, um, on, on, on the question about uh, relational, uh, the need for relational IR and the limits of an area studies perspective is a point well taken. I mean, these are some of the schools of national or regional schools that are emerging uh, have to be challenged uh, on that score that uh, they cannot simply become exceptionalist and say a Chinese school can explain only Chinese reality. Uh, they have to travel, and for that we need comparative studies and a more gener uh, generalizability. And, uh, and uh, this is why we also make that point in our, our book and, and also many of our other writings that, uh, that uh, um, the regional and national perspectives drawing on uh, expertise in countries or areas are, are welcome uh, they cannot be rejected, but they need to also rise above being parochial or, as Mira said, even imperial in some cases, which they can be. Uh, so there is a danger to that. But at the same time, I don't uh, personally uh, feel comfortable rejecting them as uh, government propaganda. They are actually not always uh, linked to the government. There's wide variations among them. Um, the other question about uh, different forms of Southern agency, uh, I think very well taken. I mean, I have actually a book called Agency and Change in World Politics. It's, like, uh, it's a different book at the Cambridge last year where I discuss exactly this question, how many different types of agency can you have? And, uh, and I start with the resistance as a form of agency. But uh, in, the, in this case of uh, uh, this book, I think that the agency claims is bringing in the agency claims, different types, ideational agency, material agency, a resistance agency, is very important uh, to global, uh, uh, global IR. Because if you don't bring in, then you bracket, you leave out a lot of contributions, like what uh, uh, Dan pointed out. Latin American women are responsible uh, single-handedly for gender equality. Uh, actually for uh, human rights as well. And uh, uh, 
Chinese and Indian uh, development thinkers contributed a lot to the Bretton Woods institutions. And we don't get to hear these stories uh, because our conception of agency is very materialistic, that big powers make big things, big plus, and create all these institutions. All these things that happened uh, elsewhere in the uh, you know, ICJ creation or uh, uh, Bretton Woods uh, creation where a lot of agency happened from the global south uh, didn't, doesn't get reflected in the literature on global governance or institutions. Mm. Um, I'll ask um, Barry to speak and then I'll come to you, Dan, if that's all right. Sorry. Okay. Um, first question. Sorry. First question, then. Um, uh, I can't say that I follow the speeches of the Malaysian Prime Minister or indeed anybody's Prime Minister. That's not my line of country. But the idea that there should be the global rule of law is a pretty old idea. Right? It goes back hundreds of years. Um, it emerges very prominently in the 19th century uh, because... Uh, something called international law begins to emerge. And the concept of international law creates a difficulty because law requires lawmakers um, and therefore a state or a government, and there isn't one. So what is international law? A debate that is uh, still ongoing. The, the view of lawyers uh, is broadly speaking that law cannot exist without society, right? that there has to be some kind of society existing in order to frame and make meaningful international law. So what the 19th century international lawyers saw happening in front of them was definitely the creation of international law about trade and standards and all kinds of stuff. So international law was happening, therefore there must be an international society because otherwise it couldn't be happening. That line of thinking takes you very much into the English school and the concept of international society as a, uh, and the kinds of order that such an international society can, on, can and cannot support. It's not a world government kind of order, and the strength and weakness of it and the nature of it changes over time. And that's, I think, where you should go and look if you want to understand that approach to, uh, uh, to international order. Um, how contemporary is the core periphery relationship? I, um, I think it's still very contemporary uh, for two reasons. One um, is that we're living downstream from it. I mean, that core periphery relationship set up in the 19th century restructured the world and pretty much everything in it, and we're still living in that structure. If you want to date modernity and where we came from, to some point of origin, it happens there. That's when practically everything in the social and political and technological world changes uh, forever. Right? So we're still working this out. And it seems to me that one of the things, uh, to go back to my theme of forgetting, it's a very good theme for somebody of my age when forgetting becomes a more common part of life, uh, but uh, it seems to me that one of the things that the West, broadly speaking, has forgotten um, is its own role in imperialism and colonialism. And what it doesn't understand is the amount of resentment that still exists out there in the global south about all of this. Right? So what's happening now, uh, I mean, Hedley Bull once talked about the revolt of the uh, the revolt against the West, and this was kind of in the 1950s and 60s. And that revolt didn't have much consequence because it wasn't attached to, to wealth or power or much in the way of political authority. Now, however, it is because the Global South is getting uh, rich and powerful and recovering its cultural authority. You don't have to spend long in China before you start hearing about the century of humiliation and everything being blamed on what foreigners did to China. That resentment is really strong. And it's now got money and power and cultural authority behind it. And so it matters to contemporary politics. And that, I think, is one of the big insights uh, of the post-colonialists. Um, so I think it's still um, extremely relevant. Um, the methodology question, um, that, I think, links to what I said about the United States and political science, and the influence of, you know, because that methodological drive comes out of American political science and is then injected into IR because in America that is political science. Um, and it's a real serious problem. Right? Um, if you talk to some of the uh, you know, leading American scholars of my sort of vintage, you know, Walt and Mearsheimer and, and that sort of stuff, they, they're panic-stricken 
they think they're becoming um, an endangered species, uh, and they are, because the methodology-driven IR has produced millions of highly competent mathematically and statistically literate people who have no sense of history whatsoever, um, ask only very small questions, which they answer in very great detail, and have no kind of larger sense uh, of things at all. And they've taken over the discipline in the United States, and there's some danger that they will take it over here because they're exporting their surplus PhDs here. So if you go to the IR department in the LSE, there's a certain amount of panic there that the people who do interesting things are becoming a minority. Um, and these people do very well on all of the kind of quantitative measures for academic performance that are measured in the uh, research assessment exercises and, uh, and all of that. So it is a problem. Um, there's an ongoing war about what the subject is about and what kind of methodologies uh, there are that are appropriate to it, and that war is not going to end anytime soon. And if the positive, positivist quant people win, uh, then I, for one, will cease to take an interest in the subject. Mind you, I'll be dead by then, so it won't matter. But, uh, <laughs> but it seems to me that would be a serious catastrophe. It's not that those people can't do anything interesting. They can do some interesting things. But if that's the only valid kind of knowledge, we're in deep, deep, deep trouble. Yeah. It's a department in which I got my PhD and in which I probably wouldn't be able to do it now. But, yeah. um, Dan, please. Let's go. Points of agreement and, and disagreement. We'll start, start with the agreement. Microphone. I think if you... Points of agreement and disagreement. Um, I think if you uh, take uh, quant to a qualified epidemiologist, uh, my wife is one, uh, they laugh. They laugh. It's junk. If you take quant to uh, serious um, uh, geographers, they're incredulous and laugh. Um, if you take quant to uh, the Royal College of Statisticians, uh, they can't be bothered to look at it. Um, I hope we might write a piece about it, but then who would read it? Um, it would be unreadable, probably. So I think quant is junk, and I think that is, is dangerous junk. It absorbs a huge amount of energy, uh, and it's deeply counterproductive. Uh, in my worst moments, I think that one of the outcomes of McCarthyism was that American IR had to stop thinking about politics, so they gave them theory and quant um, to keep them out of politics in the aftermath of McCarthyism. That is perhaps my more cynical reading. <laughs> um, but it's a huge problem. Um, in international politics, because so many people who study it then go on to become deputy assistant under bottle washers in the Pentagon or the State Department, um, and they are qualified in some kind of medieval um, uh, mysticism, frankly, and not much more. Um, so as a, a point of uh, violent agreement. Uh, a disagreement, though, I think the first question, I think, was the most profound. Uh, I'm sorry, Barry, I think it matters... Um, what prime ministers say. I think it matters what the prime minister of Malaysia says. I think in a unitary world, we're not just a global village, we're what I call Earth Avenue. You know, you can lean out of your window and shout and everybody up the street can hear you. The trouble is there are seven billion people also shouting uh, in this blizzard of information. And that's the world, the unified world we have to deal with. And there, um, the construction of uh, international law and national norms without a, an overriding authority, although I would um, take issue, I think the problem with the anarchical society is the failure to recognize that there is a real disciplining authority. The real disciplining authority is the self-destructive nature, potential of society. The disciplining authority of the bomb and the environment of disaster means states have to behave. You know, the whole point of the disciplining authority is you misbehave, you get punished. You misbehave in international relations badly, we get nuclear war. <laughs> you misbehave badly with the environment, we have the uh, civilizational crisis. So there is a, uh, an overriding um, uh, uh, ruler, governor on, on the anarchical society, and that is what drives people, such as the minister from Malaysia, empirically to say we need to develop international law to underpin international society. But that dynamic is going on against the, uh, in the contradiction of those who are retreating into nativism, and I would say with a, a last gasp attempt 
on the United States to reimpose a white patriarchal global order. I don't think we've even begun to see the beginning of it, frankly, in terms of aggressive behavior towards China and Iran, which we're seeing now. I think this will escalate, probably. Uh, and that is, the, that is the conflict we're in. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, can you put your hands up if you have questions still? Um, okay, so I can see five hands at the moment. I might take mm. as many as I can. Yes, so. I will start with here. Yes, thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah. Thanks for giving me this chance to take my advantage. I'm a colleague with Mira, Dan, and Dina here at SOAS. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm going to help save time by proposing my question directly. It is, of course, worth noting the difference between Western and non-Western theories, but I believe this is not a question of one or the other. So basically, to what extent do you think that you know, those kind of knowing Western theories can be applied to understand the contemporary world politics? Uh, you've mentioned something briefly about the Chinese school, the emergence of the Chinese school, but I think this is still a kind of minor, minor approach today. So I'm wondering how do you actually view the influence or the potential impact of those knowing Western theories? Thank you. Behind you. Yep. Thank you very much, Mustafa Demir from Staffordshire University. Uh, my question is about the role of academics and academia, as in maybe we can say agency in IR with small letters. Uh, should we just observe what's happening around us and try to provide some insights into theories? Or should we produce some normative approaches? Yeah, my question is that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've got two gentlemen in the back that have been waiting a very long time, so I'm going to send you all the way back up, up to the top. Um, thank you. One of our students just below. Hi, yes. uh, thank you. My name is Gabriel. I'm doing my PhD here at SOAS. And my question has to do with uh, the international dimension of the rise of the far right nowadays, because we see Trump, we see Bolsonaro, we see maybe Johnson here in the UK in the next few weeks. We see in India, it's becoming an international uh, uh, trend, I think. So to what extent we, we show, we, we have to look at it as an international trend? To what extent do you think that it's posing a challenge to the, to the consensus that I think that was uh, in vigor until now, according to which the international powers collaborate to keep or to maintain the international capitalist order. Do you think this nationalist uh, uh, trend is posing a threat to this consensus? And, um, and how the, the discipline of uh, international relations should, because I think my impression is that the discipline is not concerned as it should be with this, and it's not discussing it as much as it should be discussing. And I'd like to know what your, what's your uh, opinion about that. Thank you. And behind you? Yes, uh, he Lai, a researcher in London. Um, yes, I accept the, the trajectory of all of the speakers and the slants, particularly of Dr. Plesh and uh, Dr. Buzan, but I would suggest that what's perhaps possibly missing is the way in which we need to integrate this kind of understanding within a wider institutional and mediational context. And of course, uh, Dr. Plesch did do this in some ways, and I would add another example which is interesting in this respect, and that is that in Nazi Germany, one of the two Ahmadir groupings elevated a Jewish homosexual to leadership level within their ranks. And that kind of narrative on liberalization is something that we lost in this kind of world trajectory. But the point being that in the current climate of accelerated conflict in the geospheres. We need to hold our institutions across the board to account. And the media institutions often replicate the narratives that are found in IR and found in you know, the US and UK kind of right trajectories, if you like. And perhaps you know, when we look at our conceptual elaborate networks like freedom of speech and all the rest of it, it would be good to reflect upon the fact that, say, in Japan, after atomization for seven years, we had a press code which precluded any discussion on what they had suffered from. So that is something I think we can elucidate in terms of our conceptual deletions, if you like. Thank you. 
And I'll take the question down here as well. Um, hi, I'm Tanya. I'm doing my Master's in International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS. Um, thank you, your talk was very insightful. And so about the book, um, you had mentioned that an interesting point that the core countries to a certain extent during World War, the World Wars and colonialism uh, shaped discourse and knowledge. And you also mentioned that there's, co there's come a time where that's possibly changing. However, to what extent do you think that these, um, the understanding behind third world concepts such as third world or global south today is still seen through a core lens um, and is sort of a colonial legacy in that sense? Okay, thank you. Are there, yes, I'll take this other question. Um, are, if there are other questions after that, I might come back because we've already gathered quite a few uh, to give people time. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Charlie from LCIR, one of the minorities. And my question is perhaps on IR theory. Um, if we talk about core and periphery, um, it somehow implies that there is an underlying binary setting that implies that you are either a core or outside the core. So let's take like Chinese IR theory, for example. Like if it cannot produce sufficient interactions with the mainstream IR theories, um, namely the American IR theories like realism or liberalism, like it will somehow be marginalized outside of the core. So does it imply that it is doomed to fail as a theoretical project if it cannot like interact with the mainstream theories? Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So we've got lots of um, questions there. I might start in the reverse of the order that I did before. So um, start with Dan. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just pick up a couple of the questions. Um, yeah, the the Nazis. Uh, uh, well, uh, the short answer is, and I would say this, wouldn't I, because I write a lot about this, uh, uh, look at the, the politics of the radical 40s. What was the politics that defeated uh, these political forces then. We don't have to reinvent things. We do need to look, though, at what uh, was said and done then and not how it was uh, interpreted in the writings of the 60s and beyond. And sometimes we have to go back into the stacks because not everything is digitalized from that period. Uh, and I would just make one a quick plug. There's a wonderful book um, which uh, the wonderful uh, scholar at Stockholm, um, Rebecca Adami, has written about uh, but there's a memoir of um, a Pakistani diplomat, uh, Ambassador Ikramullah, written in the late 50s, talking about her experiences as an ambassador um, for Pakistan negotiating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, this book is fortunately in SOAS Library, uh, but the, the sad point about how we, as we're carrying out decolonization work and looking to reinvigorate our studies, sadly it hasn't been taken out for five years, which means that no SOS academic has put it on a reading list for students, broadly speaking. And that, I think, indicates the, uh, the problem of our presentism and not recognizing the works of those who've gone before us. And if there's one thing I might sort of suggest, which is that uh, when you're doing your literature searches, put the date search in for what is published in the 40s, what is published in the 50s, what is published in the 60s, rather than looking just at uh, what is published now. And Barry was talking about you know, how we keep forgetting. Well, one of the great advantages of the internet uh, and digitalization is that you can now very easily just search for what was published in the 40s or 50s. And so you can rediscover some of these debates uh, and contrast them with what's being done now. But very broadly, the agenda of the uh, 40s uh, centered around the UN is the one which uh, defeated the far right at that time and people of that era would think it was no accident that neoliberalism has reproduced uh, Nazism and fascism today because as I said earlier these the core components of uh, not caring about employment not caring about social protection and labor rights um, uh, not having any regulation of the global economy and global finance these at the time were all universally regarded 
by liberals, by Marxists, across the political spectrum uh, uh, as prime drivers of the world war and of, of the creation of fascism. Uh, so they would only, only really uh, query why it's taken us so long <laughs> to get into this dreadful state, given how near long neoliberalism has been, uh, has been going. Thank you. Barry. Yeah, I'll pick up two or three points. I think um, there are a couple of questions that, thank you, surrounded the Chinese uh, school, so yours and yours. Um, I, I think, I don't think this is a despairing project or one that is doomed to fail in, in any way, shape, or form. I think it's, um, it's a bit of a pioneer. I mean, let's not argue about who agrees whether they are or aren't part of the Chinese school, because that's for the Chinese to sort out. Uh, but it... What I would suggest you do uh, as a kind of mental gymnastic on this issue is uh, get yourself a nice glass of wine and sit down and ask yourself the question, what would international relations theory look like if it had been invented in right, somewhere other than the West? Um, you can start usefully with this, with the idea that Western IR theory I'm generalizing rather extravagantly, but you can come back at me for that. Uh, Western IR theory is very largely an abstraction from Western history um, with a bit of Western political theory thrown in. Right? So what would happen if you started thinking about IR theory on the basis of Chinese history um, and Chinese political theory? Okay. That's, in a sense, what uh, the, the Chinese school people, and, I mean, including people like Yan Fei Tong, who hates the Chinese school label, but he's doing the same thing. He's mining Chinese history and uh, Chinese uh, political theory for insights into international relations. And it's pretty clear that if you started from there, i.e., if IR theory had started there, it wouldn't look like it does now. Right? And you can do the same exercise for India, although it's a little bit difficult for India because the history is messier. I think you could do it for the Islamic world as well. I mean, with, uh, any of you who have read, who might have read the travels of Ibn Battuta might come up with the idea, well, as if I, our theory had started in the Islamic world, it would be basically transnationalism with very little of the state stuff in it at all uh, because this guy was able to wander from Spain to China during the, God knows, the 13th century. Um, and be recognized and employed and accepted all the way along because he was inside a culture. Right. So I think IR theory would come out differently depending on where it started. Uh, and therefore, as these, uh, as it were, excluded cultures and histories and political theories get put back into it, this is going to be to the advantage of all of us. Right. Some stuff, uh, uh, some of the discoveries of Western IR theory might well be uh, confirmed or modified or whatever, but some new stuff might come up that West, the Western way of thinking about it, which is very state-centric, doesn't actually feature very easily. So I'm looking forward to this, and I think the Chinese are pioneering uh, uh, in this, and that what's going on there uh, deserves close attention. Um, I more or less agree with uh, with Dan on the on the rise of the far right uh, question. Uh, that that this comes out of a crisis of neoliberalism. I suppose the question that interests me about this is: Are we heading back towards the relegitimation of race theory, which played such an important part in thinking about international relations in the 19th century, right up until 1945? There's quite a lot of implication in the neo-fascist mode of thinking that you're talking about. I mean, you only have to listen to Trump uh, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of others of that ilk <clears throat> to get the whole tinge that this is beginning to sound like race theory. Um, and there are elements of that in the Chinese school as well, that you could think about that in the sense that, that you know, the, the standard phrase in, uh, uh, in, in China is uh, Chinese characteristics. It's like chips in Britain. It comes with everything. Everything is with Chinese characteristics. What's that telling us? Right? It's telling us that this is a, an, an assertion uh, of uh, a very deep cultural differentiation. And that's not very far away from the same form uh, of thinking that race theory uh, uh, had. Um, on the question from up there, uh, Tanya, um, 
is global the global south a colonial construct? I think uh, I mean you can answer that one, but but I I think that's an ongoing problem for um, post colonialism. That it's a little bit like the other, some of the other questions that have exercised people about West non West, um, or, or you know core periphery or all of these things. They do tell you something important, um, but they are kind of not perfect things. I mean, who's he, for example? You know. You should know, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Who is he? Is he West, non-West? What is he? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, but you, but you could spend a lot about a lot of time arguing about it. I'm not sure where it would get you. Right. So I think the 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 classification is a is a useful one, and it and it should be uh, it should be there. Uh, it does, to some extent, reflect a history that was made largely by the West in uh, in the period we're talking about, and therefore it does reproduce that. And I know that your lot spend inordinate amounts of time arguing and worrying and fretting about whether what they're doing is reproducing Eurocentrism, right? And there, there doesn't seem to me to be an escape from that, other than deciding not to worry about it too much, just kind of say, this is a problem. Not going to go away because these things are mixed and difficult categories, and you need to be aware of it. Um, but don't drive yourself crazy. Okay, thank you, um, Amitav. Yeah, I think uh, Barry has uh, addressed um, uh, all the questions that I wanted to. So, I, and I completely agree with him. Just a couple of additional thoughts on the question of Chinese school. Uh, I will not consider it as a minor approach. Uh, maybe minor in terms of for the name. But uh, the, the kind of writing that underpins it by people like uh, Prabhat Sinya Chin is not minor. It's quite significant intellectually. And I invite you to read his uh, most recent book, uh, A Relational Theory of World Politics. Um, so, and also, I'm sure you are aware that within China, not everybody uses Chinese school. Um, in fact, uh, his colleague, Yan Suetong from Tsinghua University, completely rejects the label Chinese school. And, uh, but at the same time, they have uh, the, uh, the, the underlying sort of uh, uh, idea is that uh, Chinese uh, uh, tradition, culture, practices can be the basis for theorizing in IR. It's a very valid one. They do have to pass some tests, like as I said, they must be able to travel, they must be widely applicable, both within China and beyond China. They should not uh, simply legitimize uh, government uh, policy, which uh, some cases they do, some cases they don't. But at the same time, I would not uh, dismiss them as minor intellectually. Uh, the question on uh, international dimension of far right, I uh, sometimes worry, I wonder about that. You know, is, is there an international dimension? It depends on what do we mean by international dimension. If you look at uh, actual links, uh, meaning one feeding on the other uh, and providing material support. I really don't see that. I don't think uh, Narendra Modi gets any uh, solace uh, support from uh, the Boris Johnson or his group. Um, they may speak similar languages, but they are com completely distinct from uh, that. Uh, they emerge from very distinctly different uh, milieu or uh, context. But uh, there is a fear of contagion. So if that you talk about internationalization, so the the far right, a right, a may, uh, nationalist forces, populist forces may find comfort to see what is happening around them. Uh, certainly, some leaders of uh, like uh, maybe uh, maybe in the Philippines, they find comfort looking at Donald Trump. They might diplomatic support uh, from uh, um, President Trump. But uh, I don't think you will find that everywhere. I think uh, these far-right movements have local and uh, national origins, and they have to be contextualized as such. And they are actually, in many cases, not very new. Uh, yeah. So finally, uh, on the, uh, yeah, West, non-West is a perennial problem. No matter how much you disavow that we don't think West is uh, homogeneous uh, like non-West, it never, never goes away. Um, neither category is uh, internally consistent or homogeneous. They are a partly categories of convenience, uh, because for the lack of a better word, maybe global south, post-colonial, um, third world, but none of the categories are perfect, as Barry said. But they are also kind of significant discursive speech acts. I mean, people use those terms. Uh, and I think West uses it more than non-West. Uh, so when uh, Russia, 
uh, action in uh, Ukraine and Crimea, I saw, I remember a headline in Financial Times, it said, Russia has taken Western territory. Uh, so that means Western territory in, uh, in Ukraine. I mean, this discourse is far more common in uh, Western media. Mm. Uh, nobody says uh, in times of India that uh, Indian territory is non-Western territory. So, so as long as there is a West, there will be a non-West in, in, in a discursive, in a speech act as a speech act. And, uh, and it's also a way of self-identification. So we definitely acknowledge, appreciate all the concerns that uh, West and non-West are transitional categories or uh, they are not uh, uh, you know, consistent, homogeneous categories, either, either of them, but they're not going to go away. Uh, unless you can come up with a different word. I mean, uh, so, so they are good points of reference which we can actually use to if not for anything else, reject them. Thank you. I might actually just come in on that last question of categories. I think the important thing is not to think about categories, but relations. When we talk about a category of women, we can say, okay, the women are so different, they experience life so differently. Um, but to my understanding, at least the way in which feminist discourse understands the category of women is a group of people subject to particular forms of interpolation by a patriarchal order. Similarly, non-Western or global South is a relational category. It's, it's, it's a relational position. It's not a category as such. So if we think about in the social world, I always prefer to think about relations because that's what we're looking at. Capitalism is a relation, right? It's not a periodization in terms of history. It's a set of relations. So you can have capitalistic relations and you can have communistic relations operating within the same social sphere. You can have patriarchal relations and you can have sort of anti-patriarchal relations also trying to exist. So to the extent that the global South is a thing, it comes into being precisely in its relations with something that positions it in that space or something that treats it differently, or even a self-articulation such as, you know, we are practicing South-South solidarity or whatever. Um, but it only, and in a way, it kind of speaks to what Amitav was saying about um, categories. But that's why we have to think of them as relations, not categories um, for that. OK, we are kind of out of time. Um, and I apologize to the remaining questioners. Perhaps you can uh, uh, approach the bench uh, to <laughs> ask any follow-up questions. Thank you all very much for attending for your excellent questions. Thank you very much to Barry and Amitav for joining us here and to Dan and Fadil and all the other people involved in hosting it. Uh, I hope you'll join me in a round of applause. <laughs>